Hi, Team Ascend. I'm Joseph Massieri. I'm going to be a senior instructor at Ascend California this year. And this is going to be a lecture about like how to preside. It's mostly meant for those who are beginning to preside and want to just like do it in case there's no one else in around. Just some history about my background presiding. I presided at the NSDA 2020 House of Representatives final round. And with me, I have Sarah Youssef, an Ascend intern for this year. And Sarah, would you give us a little bit of background about your time presiding? Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Youssef. I'm currently a junior. And like Joseph said, I'm an Ascend intern. Um, some of my achievements as POing go as far as Sunvite finals and other out rounds at Harvard, Emory, and other national tournaments. Awesome. So just a bit of a disclaimer, this presiding lecture will go over the NSDA rules for presiding. And I know that in some states, the rules might be different than NSDA rules. So unfortunately, this lecture might not be the most applicable for your local tournaments. But if you go anywhere on the circuit or to nationals, this lecture will be how the presiding officers will follow procedures. So first and foremost, I think one of the most important things for all presiding officers to do just to like get your head in the game is to read through Robert's Rules of Order. There's a lot of online PDFs that you can use to access like cheat sheet versions of it. They're either like five to six pages, or if you really want to go above and beyond, you can read the whole book, which is about 160 pages in PDF form. But just in general, it tells you a lot about like the different motions that will be done within Congress and like a lot of the different voting numbers needed. In Congress in general, there tends to be voting motions of one third, a simple majority, and two thirds. And the Roberts Rules of Order sheet will just tell you which motions are accompanied by which voting procedures. So Robert's Rules of Order can be super helpful, um, either when you're first beginning to have a resource that's pretty standard instead of just going off of what someone's telling you, um, or if you're at a higher level at POing, I've always loved to use it as something I can get better versed with when it comes to the motions um, or the more of the niche things when it comes to POing, because your job learning of the PO is really never done. There's always more to learn, especially in Robert's Rules of Order. Yeah. So just a little bit of a TLDR on Robert's Rules of Orders, and especially for like some of the most important motions that are going to be used in every single round that you might find yourself presiding in. You have um, motions like recesses in between bills. You're almost always going to find a natural break in debate, in which case you will recess. The simple majority is needed for that procedure. So if you have a room of 18 people, you only need 10 people and you'll move to a recess. Outside of that, the most important motions are to open Congress, to open the floor for docket nominations, previous question. And was I missing any of them there? I think there's also amendment procedure, which we can get more into. But what should you expect when a round is actually starting? Well, if it's the first round of prelims or if it's semis, finals, you're always going to need to set a docket. Now, opening the floor for docket nominations is a motion that is never going to be like denied. You can ask for, you don't need to take a formal vote. You just ask for any seconds and everyone in favor. Everyone should be in favor of that. The way docket nominations work is different speakers will nominate their docket, which consists of bill one, bill two, bill three. Someone else, if they don't like that order, might nominate a different docket consisting of bill two, bill one, bill three. From there, you'll vote on the bills. A simple majority on the docket will win the election, and that will be your agenda for either all of the preliminary rounds or whichever out round you are in. Anything to add to that? So this changes a little bit if you're online um, or even in person. I found that when people are setting dockets, a lot of times you'll have like a few dockets that circulate before just due to the discussion that debaters will have. Um, so if you're online, you're going to want to put those in the chat as you're talking um, and like saying them out as a PO. So as someone like proposes a docket, work on putting that in the chat. If you're in person and there is a whiteboard, a lot of times it's super helpful to write it on the whiteboard as you're doing that. So that way you can put the vote under each, or if you're online, you can copy and paste the actual docket that you voted on in the chat. So if you're about to begin the actual presiding of the round after docket nominations, or you're just presiding around where the docket's already set, you're going to need to know time signals. These are something that probably everyone who has competed within a round are going to be familiar with because this is one of the things that not only affect a presiding officer, but affect you as a speaker as well. The conventional gavel timings right now are one tap at two minutes of your speech, two taps at two minutes and 30 seconds, three taps at two minutes and 55. And then at this point, the presiding officer will usually stand up and begin to tap their gavel, getting progressively louder from three minutes to three minutes and 10 seconds, at which case they'll cut you off at three minutes and 10 seconds. So if you're online, obviously you can't use gavel taps because they won't be clear for every single speaker. Um, so you're gonna wanna create time cards. 
I created time cards for the national tournament in 2021 that was online. Um, I like to color code mine personally because I think they, one, separate you as a PO. Two, they're just a little bit easier to see. So like Joseph said, I had um, a green one at two minutes and then another one at 2.30 and then a red one at 2.55. So you're going to want to use those. Um, for direct questioning, you'll use one tap at 20 seconds and two taps at 30 seconds. Um, but if you're online, you make another time card for those. And I tend to also just use like a bright colored note card to hold up when I'm done if I'm online. So that way people come to a close when you're talking, especially if your mic isn't the best. Yeah. Some tournaments might have final appeals. They aren't the most common, but when they do happen, it's good to know how to do them. The timing procedures for those are a bit up in the air right now, but something that I have seen a lot of debaters currently be in favor of is for a one minute and 30 second final appeal, you tap once at one minute elapsed and you tap twice at one minute and 25 seconds, and then you cut them off when the one minute and 30 seconds has elapsed. So now that you know the very basics of how to actually like run someone's speech, how are you going to be picking who is speaking when? So now that you've finished most of the procedures for the start of the round, um, we're gonna get into how you should be presiding during the actual round. So online or in person, you're going to want to try to make a spreadsheet online. Um, as shown on the screen, this is the spreadsheet that I use that I personally made. Um, it doesn't have to look like this. And I've seen um, different levels of spreadsheets. It just has to be able to like have everything down. So that way you can increase the transparency within the round. Um, on here, I pretty much list all of my time procedures. Um, any of the docket or dilatory motions. And then I also have any legislation packets that help a lot of the judges just stay intact with the round. Along with that, I also have the amendment procedures, which we'll now go over now that you know a little bit more about how to formally start the round. Amendment procedure isn't going to be the most common, but if you encounter it, it's very good to know how to do it. So it starts with the speaker who is intending to amend by will motion to personal privilege. You'll ask them to state their privilege and it will be approach the chair. They'll walk up to the parliamentarian who will hand them an amendment slip, which is just a slip of paper that pretty much has like fill in the blank to what they want to change in the bill. When they go sit back down, they'll write down what the amendment they want is. And during any other time that you will be taking a motion, they will then motion again for another personal privilege to approach the chair again, in which case they will turn in their amendment slip. The parliamentarian will rule over their amendment to determine whether or not it's germane. And a germane amendment is pretty much just one that doesn't change the intention of the bill. It might be something as simple as this bill was supposed to go into effect in six months. Well, now we have a year, but you're not going to change the identity of a bill as it would be debated. If the parliamentarian determines it's germane, you get to move to amend. That takes a one third second. And after the one third second, you are now debating the amendment itself. You are debating whether or not the amendment's a good idea or a bad idea, and you will give speeches on the amendment as such. Now, if no one wants to give a speech, you can just previous question the amendment immediately and vote on whether or not it belongs in the bill. But if they choose to speak on it, authorship rules do not apply here, and you will go off of like the other precedents in recency to like determine who gets to speak on the amendment. Now, after previous question, if it passes, you're now debating an amended piece of legislation, and if it fails, the amendment's just thrown out and nothing happens. That's the exact same thing that happens if the parley determines it's not germane. You'll just throw it out and the entire procedure ends right there. So this gets a little less complicated online if you're on Zoom because instead of um, point of personal privilege, you'll just send it in the private chat um, to your like PO or parliamentarian and then they'll roll on it. Um, and as a PO, your job is to like tell the chamber there is an amendment on the floor. Um, and then send it once the parley rules on it. So the most important part of presiding, or at least what's going to take the most of your time, is picking who gets to speak and when. So Sarah, if you could just lead us through how your spreadsheet works, that would be incredible. Yeah, so um, on my spreadsheet, I have a few names, which you might see um, around our Ascend website with our upcoming staff for the summer. Um, but I have two different sheets for speech recency and for questioning recency, um, just so that way I don't get them mixed up. And I'm very able, I'm very much able to tell where I am at the different times in the debate. I've seen people keep them on the same sheet. It's really up to you and your preference. So when I'm picking speeches, it depends on if a tournament has preset recency or not to how I pick the speakers. Now, if that if they don't have preset recency, which is basically a list that they give you before the round that's very outlined of 
here is like the list of speakers in this order. You'll call on random if you don't have that list. Um, so if I were to stand and um, Shordia were to stand, I would have to pick myself. Of course, you want to remain unbiased while doing this. Um, don't favor people from your school or people you may know. You just want to stay the most unbiased as possible. Um, and so as you call people, you'll then put down their name on the spreadsheet. And I like to black out their name when they're first going. And then I fill in their side as well as their time as I'm going on. Um, let's say someone else has a second speech though. Instead of blacking out their name, I would probably just put it in a dark gray to indicate that they have spoken, but so that way the judges can still see the side and the time that they went in case that they need to for the sake of their ballots. If someone has given a speech two times and both of them, or one time and both of them stand, here's how you'll pick um, if they were to go or not. So let's say that Shordia and Peng both gave one speech and both of them stand. I'll simply look at who's higher on the list and then pick them to give their second speech. Awesome. So now we can move on to like cross-examination. It's basically the exact same procedure as picking speeches, except you're not gonna be put, putting down their side or the time of it. Um, just a quick disclaimer though, if it's a tournament using preset recency, you should reverse the preset recency for questioning priority. That's um, just in case like if someone has like last preset recency, they at least get first preset recency for cross-examination. Now, if there's no preset, you'll just go off the exact same thing of randomness, then precedence, then recency. Yeah, so uh, if like you did have preset, for example, um, my list wouldn't go Lu, Shordia, Sandel, Peng. Instead, it would go Miller, Donaldson, Yusuf, Peng, etc. Um, just to give a more equitable chance to those who may not have the best recency in the round. Um, and it makes debate a lot more interesting and you're not just hearing from the same people again and again. Um, so it's a similar thing with questions. If I were to put down um, myself and then someone else and then... I were to have someone else give a second question, I would just continue to black out their name as they give those questions. You never wanna gray out anything. Um, I've seen some people just put it in a really dark color, but for me, I still would probably get tripped up and call them accidentally. So I just black out their name so that way I can very, very clearly see who's given two questions or one questions and call from there. Um, so along with this, I know that around the circuit, there has been some talk about automated spreadsheets. So while automated spreadsheets can be a great tool to make sure that you're calling on the right person, they're not always the best to use because if you're in some higher level rounds, some judges will frown upon you using them um, as it kind of cancels out the art of POing. Um, and overall, it's just a great idea to be able to call on those like people um, in your round without relying on a um, formula in your spreadsheet as sometimes those can be faulty um, or if you really have to go by pen and paper let's say something happens to your internet then at least you know how to PO um, if something happens. Yeah so after you've been picking speakers and picking questioners for you know two and a half three hours you'll now get to like the motions like previous question and orders of the day. Previous question is just the simple motion at the end of every bill in order for previous question to take effect, it needs a second, and then it needs a two-thirds majority or a two-third majority vote to actually start voting on the piece of legislation. Now, from there, if it's a bill or a resolution, simple majority and it will pass. If it's a constitutional amendment, two-thirds majority, and then the constitution is then amended. Orders of the day is a bit different, however. Um, technically, you are only supposed to do it at the end of like a round session. So if it's like if there's three prelim rounds, you'll do it at the end of the third prelim. In the last bill in the third prelim. If it's an out round where there's only one out round, say one semifinal round, you will do it on the last bill of that semifinal. Obviously, it will be a bit different for tournaments like the Tournament of Champions or NSDA Nationals, where there's two rounds of each out round, in which case you'll do it on the last bill of the second out round. Orders of the day is basically identical to previous question. It's just a fancier way to say it. And at the end of orders of the day, you'll go, we got through X amount of speeches and X amount of questions, and we passed X amount of bills. We failed X amount of bills. So one important thing as your time comes to a close in that round as a PO is once, like Joseph said, that you call orders of the day um, or you just adjourn that round, you're going to want to make it really clear to your judges 
um, that you are a presiding officer and that you can still be eligible among the ranks of your competitors. So something I like to do is just have a quick thing where I'm like, we got through this many speeches and this many questions. If you think that I was a fast, fair and efficient PO, please consider me in your ranks. And then I give my name again um, and just remind them that I'm also a competitor. Along with that, throughout the round, you'll be wanting to remind your judge every hour that you are eligible for a speech score. Um, because as a PO, you're not giving speeches, obviously. So for every hour presiding, you get a speech score. So now that you know how to get yourself through a round, Sarah, do you have any recommendations on how someone can like practice presiding outside of a round? So because competitions don't happen every single day, I found that one really helpful tip for me um, was if I were to watch a recording of a round, there's tons of recordings of like Harvard, Emory finals or like all of those rounds, um, most of the time you can figure out if they had preset recency or were just calling at random. And then from there, just going through the recorded round as if you were PO um, and practice calling on the questioners as the order that you have them and then double checking with the PO. That's been a super helpful tip anytime I don't have a round to actually practice for. If you want to learn more about presiding or just anything Congress related in general from myself and others of our wonderful staff, please sign up for Ascend California taking place in my hometown of Sacramento from July 9th to 23rd of this year. I hope to see you all there.